the Holocaust, the systematic roundup and murder of more than six million Jews and the death of millions of others during World War II was the policy of the German Nazi government. That the Holocaust happened is irrefutable historical fact. The way to ensure this never happens again is to listen and learn and always remember. The voices of those who perished in the roundups, ghettos, transports, forced labor concentration and extermination camps are stilled. To this day, their ashes float silently in the atmosphere around us. But there are those who miraculously and courageously survived the maelstrom of Nazi anti-Semitic violence. There are among us people who have endured the most brutal inhuman treatment imaginable. One such hero is Ethel Kirschenbaum. The Germans came into our town and they had a selection where most of our town was taken away. And they told us that they were taking them to uh, work camps. My aunt, who had 14 children, was left with one daughter. And then they put us into sort of like a ghetto. They segregated uh, a certain area in town where we all had to move into. And we lived there for about six months. And then they made a second selection, which was a complete surprise. Nobody knew before we had warning so we could hide. This time, there was no warning. And uh, they put a, brought us all into the uh, square again. Uh, my dad escaped. And they took me and my mom, my sister, my aunt, and my two cousins to the, to the town prison. People who were trying to escape, they were shooting them on the spot. They saw old people, they shot them right on the spot. They saw a little child. They took the child out of the mother's arms and shot the child right there. The cemetery was right next to the, t to the prison. They said, if I'm going to, we're going to be shot, we want to be shot right here on the prison. And they took my grandparents and they shot them right on the cemetery. And we went to prison, all of us. And then they came in the middle of the night and they took out my aunt, my sister, and they brought them to the cemetery and they shot them. And one of the prison guards, which was a Pole, my dad used to do business with him. He saw us in the prison. He opened the door and he said, run. At least you'll be shot like a person because where are you going? It's going to be horrible. So we ran and nobody would hide us and nobody would help us. And then my mom went into a barn and she saw that nobody was there. And we were hidden in that barn without the knowledge of the owners. One night, we heard someone coming up, and we thought for sure that the Germans had discovered us. And all of a sudden, we heard my dad's voice. And when he found out the ordeal that we were going through, he said, look, it's a working camp. It's not a concentration camp. You will be better off being there. And that's what we did. We went with our dad to this camp. My mom was a, a fantastic seamstress, and the head of the camp, whose name was Fikes, went around asking if there was anyone here who could sew. And my mom said that she was a seamstress by profession. And he brought a machine for her, and she was making shirts for him. And she was making things for his wife sent to Germany, and he made a selection. And he took whatever old people were there and all the young children and put them on one side to be shot. 
when he selected me, uh, selected a lot of my friends. My cousins were older than me, so they went to the line where you live. I went to the line to be killed. And when my mom saw that he put me, she was holding me by my hand, that he put, that he was putting me over there, she said, you can't do that. Don't you remember me? She says, I, I do all, so all these things for you and your wife. And he looked at her and he wrenched me away from her and she ran back to him and she said, don't kill her, kill me instead. And he shot her right on the spot in front of me and he let me go. I was separated from my dad and we went on to this transport and we were put on the cattle trains without food and without water. It was just like a box car with wall-to-wall -wall people. You couldn't lie down if you wanted to. It was so crowded. We were just standing up, holding each other up, shoulder to shoulder. And then all of a sudden, the doors opened and we heard, Rouse, Rouse, get out, get out. And we all went out and we were marched into a compound. And as we looked up, we saw it said Auschwitz. And then we, we lined up uh, two in a, in a line marching, marching in. And as we were going into a room, which supposedly they called it the, the lousing room, supposed to take a showers and, and shave your hair and we came in front of uh, an SS man, uh, tall, very well dressed, with white gloves on. And as we were walking on, he was going this way and this way, this way or this way. The selection process was as simple as it was brutal. The strong, those who could work as slave labor, lived. The rest were exterminated. And when he came to me, he was just about to go like that when my cousin ran up and she said, she looks little, but she's very strong. And she's really 17 years old and she worked in the salt mines. Look how, how strong she is. And he looked at me and he, and he told me to go to the side with my cousins. SS women with, with shaving our hair, not just cutting it, but shaving it completely with a, with, a, with a razor. There was a blonde SS woman that was shaving me, and she looked at me and she says to me, was machst du here? What are you doing here? I was an extremely pretty child. I had platinum, long platinum hair, uh, very wavy, and I didn't look Jewish. And she wanted to know, maybe there was a mistake. She says, you don't look Jewish, you look Aryan. And uh, she shaved my hair anyway. I was given a little short dress up to here. My hair was shaved. And I was given wooden shoes. There we are in Holland, the clogs. And uh, we went to the barracks. I was very sick. I was throwing up all the time. I, I couldn't take the smell from the, from the crematoriums. And I wanted to get out of there from the worst way that I could. And someone said there was a transport leaving in Auschwitz, that you had to go and tell the commandant that you wanted to leave. So my two cousins and I decided that we were gonna leave if we could get out of here because I, I, I had to get out. I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. The little that I had to eat, I couldn't eat constantly. The smoke, the, the coming up and the, and the odor from, from the dead, from bodies being burned, I, I, I couldn't stay here. So we went. And we truly went to a worst hell.
we went to a place called Stutthof, where Auschwitz was half a heaven compared, compared to how this was. But I always felt, wherever I went since my mother was killed, that I was going to live. I always felt my mother was with me. And when we got there, we had the same thing. We had the selections. And he just put me with my cousins, where he took stronger people immediately to the others. Once again, Ethel Kirschenbaum was chosen for her looks, her near Aryan looks. A guard took her in tow and brought her to the camp kitchen. I decided that I wasn't going to live anymore. I, how could I go through all of this? I had my two cousins, but how could I possibly survive all of this? When I come home and, and come back to the barracks, someone who is bigger than me and stronger than me just dies of starvation. So I decided whatever, I'm going to take some chances. And what I did was, I, uh, as I peeled the potatoes, I peeled half of it. And I put it into the container where, where the potato peels were going, so that the peel should, because people were eating it raw, so that at least they should have some potato on it rather than just the peel. Ethel Kirschenbaum was determined to help her fellow prisoners, and she did. But then the brutality of the Nazi captors surfaced, and life or death was once again on the line. And then they had another selection, and they took my cousins away. And I was left alone. At that time, I said, that's it. I knew my mom was dead. I knew my sister was dead. I knew almost everyone was dead. And so what did I deserve that I have that I'm going to survive this. As the Allied armies hammered away at the collapsing Third Reich, the Soviet army approached Stutthof. Now time was on Ethel's side, or so she thought. We heard shots, a lot of fire and we were told that the Russians were approaching and they had to get the camp out. And they took us out on a train and we, draw, we, we were on the train for about four days with very little food and then they put us on boats. In a desperate effort to hide their crimes, the Nazis moved the surviving prisoners out of the camps. In Ethel's case, by train and then by boat. They were on the Baltic Sea for 10 days with only salt water for sustenance. My body was swollen from, from drinking all the salt water. And we were sure that none of us were going to survive. And then we heard bombs. And we all said, thank God, at least we're going to die like human beings. But Ethel and the others didn't die. The planes that attacked their boat were British. As they saw, the planes saw that people were going into the water, they zoomed down and they saw that, that it was inmates, that there were people who were wearing the striped thing, so they threw life preservers down. Ethel and her fellow survivors swam to shore. It was the town of Neustadt, then in the hands of the British Army. And so they were finally liberated. We were in this hospital, and they tried to get people to speak to us that, that we could understand. Nobody spoke Yiddish. It was a strictly German town. They were trying to get the water out, out of us and to feed us uh, very, very slowly. Those who were over 18 were going to be released to do whatever, to search for their families. Those under 18, they were going to take to Switzerland to a rest home to recuperate. I knew a lot of my family was dead, but I, I 
could not believe that everyone was dead. I felt my dad was alive. Uh, I, I, nobody knew. I didn't see him get killed. I felt uh, out of all my hundreds of cousins and my aunts and my uncles, somebody had to survive. And not knowing very much about geography, I felt that if they sent me to Switzerland, it was the end of the world. I was never going to find anybody. So I pleaded with them to please let me stay so I can go travel through Germany and Poland and see if I can find anybody from my family. And they said, no way, you're too young. I was, I was then 12 and a half. As the war ended, thousands of concentration camp survivors began to look for the remnants of their families, their towns, their lives. For Ethel, hope was all she had to hold on to. Hope and a stroke of luck. This man happened to be looking and he recognized my name because he was my dad's best friend. And he signed that he was my uncle and he brought me to this, to this town in Lubeck where I met a lot of uh, people. Ethel found people from her hometown, but not her father. However, a man in town had a picture. And he said, I have this picture of all these people that I survived with. Maybe you'll recognize somebody. And I looked at this picture, and the one in the striped jacket is my father. And I looked at the picture, and I said, this is my father. And I said, where is he? He says, he's in Felderfink. I said, OK, I'm going. He says, you can't go because your father traveled through half of Germany, and whoever he met, they told him that you can't possibly be alive. So he decided that he wants to go and settle in Israel and live in Israel. So I wrote my dad a letter, which my dad kept. And uh, I sent him this letter. It says, my dearest daddy, it's really me. I'm alive. And the man told me that you're trying to go to Israel. If by some miracle you decide to come back, this is where I am. I've been all alone waiting for him. And God answered my prayer. I love you so much, Daddy. I can't wait to hug you. I don't think I'll ever live to see the moment where I'll see your face again. If you come back and you find these, please put on wings and come fly to me. If not, I will see you in Eretz Yisrael, your loving daughter. Well, he came into the town of Felderfink, and the man was outside, and he saw him get off the train. And he said, I can't believe it. He says, it's a miracle. I don't believe it. Look. And he ran with the letter to give to my father. And he said, look, I have a letter. I found your daughter. She's alive. Ethel had no idea that her father had returned to continue his search and that he had her letter. She made plans to go to Israel to find him. And then one night, we were all sitting at, at the table, and we're eating, and I hear a little knock, very soft. And we turned around and said, anybody hear a knock? And my friend said, yeah, I think someone's at the door. And the four of us are sitting, and one of my friends gets up, and she opens up the door. And there's two people standing there. And one is slowly pushing the door open, like a centimeter at a time. And when it's in full fling, I see my dad standing there. Of course, I flew into the zone. <laughs> From that moment on, we were inseparable. Imagining the daily horror that 12-year-old Ethel Kirschenbaum endured is impossible. Yet when it was over, she found the courage and strength to search for her father and he for her. What a marvelous act of faith and what a great reward to find one another. Ethel and her father, along with the 
tattered remnants of many broken families, came to America in October of 1946. He married another Holocaust survivor who had also been in Auschwitz. They put the horror behind them as best they could and began a new life. Ethel grew up, married, had two children and three grandchildren. Her father died in 1991. Although they made a new life in America and both loved their adopted country, they never forgot what they had left behind and they never took the blessing of freedom for granted. By wits, by luck, by miraculous twists of fate, every Holocaust survivor wonders, why me? Why did I survive and not others who were stronger? Why? For Abraham Rodstein, the journey from childhood to manhood was a nightmare filled with many extraordinary twists and turns. Until the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union, the two countries had a non-aggression pact. Part of the deal allowed Soviet troops to occupy Lithuania. Then when Germany broke the pact and attacked, German troops poured into the tiny country. As in every other country they occupied, they brought their anti-Semitic brutality with them. I was born in a town in Lithuania called Shaulai or Shavli, as it was known in Russian or Yiddish, October 16, 1928. My father had a cafe, a bakery, a movie house, and other associated business. The atrocities to the Jews started mainly in the smaller towns rather than in a town like Kovno. They took one old part of town, which was called Viljampoli, or Slobodka, like it was called in Yiddish, and they designated that to be the ghetto. They built a uh, barbed wire fence, and uh, one day we were told that we have to move in into the ghetto. And the way things happened is essentially you could exchange houses with the local population in that particular geographic area, which was the ghetto. So due to the fact that we lived in this very nice modern building in Kovno, we, the people, my father's relatives, so owned that house, she exchanged that house with some Lithuanians in what's going to be the ghetto. The only thing is that in one house, which was meant maybe to house half a dozen people, you wind up with about 50 or 60 people, so you didn't really live in an apartment or a building anymore, you only had a room. And that room usually used to house the whole family. You didn't go to school anymore, uh, professionals couldn't work in their professions anymore. You were not allowed to walk on the sidewalk. You had to walk on the street. You also had to take off your hat whenever you saw a German. Fear was the biggest emotion we felt. Fear of everything. Fear of uh, not surviving for the next 10 minutes. Fear of, uh, of being killed. Fear of being hungry. Fear of being... Fear was a instrument by which the Germans were actually uh, reigning. Because if you can instill fear in people, a very small amount of uh, people can control a very large amount of people. We lived in constant fear, yes, in constant dread. Everything the Germans did was with controlled chaos. Because in a chaos, people don't think clearly and they do what, they, what, what they're told to do. The inhuman brutality that was being perpetrated by the Germans in other parts of Europe began to raise its ugly head in Lithuania. Even though he was just a boy of 15, Abraham Rodstein quickly learned what selection meant and how to survive. You started being aware of it because you knew what's, 
We knew what was taking place in Poland. We also knew about mass killings which took place in the forests around it. In Kovno, they used to bring people and they used to kill them and then burn them. The German Jews were not brought in freight cars. They were brought in regular cars. We used to work on the railroad and periodically we had the opportunity to come in contact with them. And we used to tell them, try to somehow blend in amongst us. Try to get in with us to the ghetto because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but for today we seem to be safe. They never paid attention to us. They were not resettled. They were immediately taken to the ninth fort, shot and burned. The following day, there were no more. In the three years, the ghetto got smaller and smaller, and those things got less and less, and conditions became worse, because you can imagine, here is this house, it's a house almost like the house I live in now, and there were maybe about six or eight families living in that house. So for cooking, you cooked, we created little, we were ingenious enough to make little cooking stoves out of sheet metal, and we used to use kindling wood to cook. There was no heat anymore, so we used to burn our furniture. Actually, cut off legs from the table, and little by little, you just got rid of your furniture by burning it. Although life was very hard, and fear permeated every aspect of their existence, the surviving Jews in the Kovno ghetto managed to keep going until one day when the German final solution began to reach out for them. We were told very simply that the ghetto is going to close and whoever is here has to appear in such and such a place and they were taken by truck to the uh, railroad yards and they were a whole bunch of uh, cattle cars and we had to go in there and eventually they closed up the trains. The uh, trains started moving and we were going towards Germany. It was June, it was hot, the cars are closed, there's no air to breathe, there are no toilet facilities. So uh, the, the, after a very short time the stench became impossible. I was still with my parents, with my father and mother. The first stop, major stop, was in East Prussia in a place called Stutthof. Stutthof was a concentration camp. At that place they made us disembark from the uh, trains and they separated women and children. I was tall enough so I could pass as a non-child or an adult. My mother was taken away at that time, and she wound up staying in Stutthof. Abraham and his father boarded the train again and moved deeper into Germany. It was a journey that took him away from his mother and toward a life of slave labor and unimaginable hardship. Two or three days later, we wound up in Bavaria, in a place called Landsberg. Landsberg was also the same place where Hitler wrote Mein Kampf. Landsberg was a satellite camp of Dachau. Around Landsberg, there must have been at least half a dozen camps. Each camp housed probably about three or 4,000 people. And I wound up in a camp called Lager Einsmins Camp 1, which was right at the outskirts of the town, Landsberg. I was in that camp from June or July 1944 till middle of April 1945. It was a labor camp, but the minute you got sick for more than a day or two and you could not work anymore, they sent you to another camp and over there they didn't shoot you, they just let you starve to death. The fact is that 95% of the people who came to all these camps died in within the uh, 10 months we were there.
The roll call was done every morning, and they used to arouse you in the middle of the night, and you used to stand there from maybe 5 in the morning till 7, and then they used to give you some black coffee and a piece of bread, and that was your ration for the day. And the other ration was when you came back, they gave you some watered-down soup and uh, another piece of bread and margarine. It wasn't enough to sustain you. In a lot of the cases, it wasn't enough to kill you, so people just uh, existed somehow. The prisoners were slaves. They worked from dawn to dark. The conditions were subhuman. About four or five kilometers outside of town was a huge construction project, and I happened to have been working on that construction project. They dug out the ground, and then they put in over the ground reinforced concrete, and on top of the reinforced concrete, they planted trees, so from aerial photography, you couldn't see anything. And they, my job was to work on the reinforced concrete where you connect uh, the girders together and you twist them with wire. Now, you can imagine, it was winter. All I had on was my striped suit because I didn't have any civilian clothing anymore. All I had on was clogs not even shoes, and I had no gloves. When I worked there, my hands used to freeze to the, to the metal girders, and my skin used to get torn off. Luckily, the way I prevented infection when I used to finish work, there was a big diesel, a, a, a big uh, barrel with diesel oil. I used to soak my hands in diesel oil. That may have done the trick, I don't know. Somebody was cold in the winter, so they cut a piece of blanket to wrap around their feet. That was translated as destroying German government property, and the penalty for it was death. So I remember very vividly three people got hung in the camp because of trying to keep their feet warm. We became very, very fast lice infect, infested. And, uh, the first time I saw a louse, that was a lot of horror. And then you just got used to it. And all you had to do is just uh, kill them between your fingernails. The Germans decided to clean us up, that we shouldn't have any lice anymore. So they built a bath, which was maybe about half a kilometer outside of the camp. We didn't know what's going to happen because when they say bat, we figured it's probably a place they'll guess us, because that type of information already seeped out and came true. The German killing machine was now in high gear. Millions of Jews and others were being systematically murdered. Abraham Rothstein knew about Nazi gas chambers, and so did the rest of the world. So here it is. I have the equivalent of about 102 or 103 fever. It's winter, I have nothing on, just striped suit. I have to walk through the cold, to the snow, into the bath to get cleaned up. I get there, we go through the cleaning up, the shower, and there was no gas. It was really exactly what it was supposed to be. And I collapsed and I fainted. A lot of people died. They threw me on a wagon with dead people. So here I'm in the cold, maybe it was 25 or 30 degrees Fahrenheit, and I'm on this wagon with dead people. I wasn't quite dead yet. It so happens that that Dr. Berman walked by, and it so happened that he took my pulse, and it so happened he recognized me. My pulse was running. He dragged me back to the hospital, and he took care of me. In one of those incredible twists of fate that so many Holocaust survivors experienced, young Abraham Rothstein was rescued from death's door. His good luck and special skills landed him a job inside. There was a German hospital, on the, an SS hospital actually, outside of the camp, and they didn't have enough of their own doctors, so they uh, used our doctors to actually uh, take care of uh, Germans. And they used to come with all kinds of fractured legs and whatnot. And at that time, I made 
when you have fractures, you have this needle, this, uh, there's rods going through the knee, and you have pulleys, you know, to keep it straight. And I was very good. I used to make these things. So that kept me, you know, doing things. And doing things, uh, I was useful. I also learned how to uh, take care of radios. So I used to go out of the camp, from the inner camp, which was, and then go to the outer camp where the Germans live, just tell them my uh, number which was uh, prisoner number 81, 170 was my number. And I used to go in and I used to fix radios. While I used to fix it, I used to listen to the BBC in German. So I got very quickly a very good idea of what's going on. I memorized it. And I used to come back to camp, so other people. And you know, so we knew really what's going on. Also, if they would have caught me, they would have shot me. But life didn't mean much, so it didn't really. Uh... The American used to come and used to could hear the drone of the airplanes, and then used to hear bombs dropping, and the Germans used to run right away to the shelters. We didn't even bother going to shelters because even when we worked on the sites where there were shelters, because I figured, why should I go to shelters? It's friendly people. Then I think even though plenty of people died from friendly fire. Commandant of this particular camp, his name was Kirsch, says, Germany is going to perish at 12, but you are going to perish at 11.59. Abraham Rothstein's Nazi captors were quite wrong. You see, they were the ones who never left Landsberg. After the war, there was a war crimes trial. Kirsch was tried. Kers was executed. In the middle of April, the small camp, like uh, Camp One, the satellite of Dacha, was starting to be closed up, and we were being transported now again on cattle cars to the main camp Dachau. It was a very short ride. Dachau, the first concentration camp the Germans built, was also one of the most brutal. But at the time Abraham Rodstein and his father were transferred there, the American army was closing in fast. The Third Reich was crumbling. Germany was in flames. A day or two later, I was sort of half asleep. It was in the evening, and some Frenchman tugs on my blanket, and he starts yelling, American, American. And, and he drags me out, and I go out. And here I see American soldiers, and they liberated the camp. On April 28, 1945, the U.S. Army entered Dachau. Most of the German guards and SS officers either fled or tried to blend in with the prisoners. When the soldiers realized what they had liberated and what had gone on there, some of them could not be controlled. They killed every German they found. The sight of American GIs chasing down and killing the SS tormentors must have been surreal to those long-suffering prisoners. While Abraham Rodstein, a victim of Nazi oppression, was on one side of the barbed wire, Lester Strickoff, a Jewish GI from Brooklyn, was one of those American liberators. When we got like about 10 miles out of Dachau, that's when this smell hit us. And that smell is the worst thing I've ever had to count with for everybody. We have these wool knit hats in the army under the, our uh, helmets. Everybody was taking them off and putting them up to their noses. They were men vomiting from the smell. That's how strong it was. We knew already the smell of death. We knew. We had smelled death when we had come across dead soldiers laying in the field. So we knew that pungent, sweet odor. But this was so strong that men were, were getting sick. When we got into the town itself, beautiful town, like I told you, white flags all over, people walking around like nothing happened. It's unbelievable. We drove the last mile to where the fence had been broken into at the ovens, and we got out, and we started to walk in. And it was... It was the most horrible thing I'd ever seen.
people saw these things, but they could not imagine in their wildest dreams what had taken place here. And we walked into these ovens, and it's a day later, and they were still smoldering with bodies in there. And they deliberately left the bodies in there, the officers, because they wanted the people to see. Not because it was a, they were, they were, had been burned already. And saw dead bodies. We walked by corpses that were still alive. We called them corpses because that's what they were. The ribs were sticking out, the whole thing, the smell, the smell was just. When we saw the gold fillings, the teeth in one of the barracks, and the suitcases, and the hair, it was incomprehensible. You know, when people are dying, you leave them to die and that's it. There's nothing you can do for them. We couldn't. Those that we saw that were lying there. But those that we, they were piled 10 high, 20 high, who knows how long, skin and bones. The pit was about, I guess, the worst thing of all. The pit must have been about the size of a football field. Easy. Oh, easy. If not as wide, but long. Skin and bones. Mostly bones. Eye sockets that, no, no eyes. It was a sight that you remember for the rest of your life. Abraham Rodstein and his father were liberated on April 28, 1945. Miraculously, his mother survived Stutthof. The Rodsteins were one of the few families left intact after the Holocaust. They immigrated to America in 1950 and started life anew. Abraham Rodstein became a successful engineer, married and had three children. He has no interest in visiting Lithuania but he has been back to Germany on business and as a witness, a survivor. 53 years after the fact, in a very special moment, prisoner and liberator finally met. In fact, they may have passed by one another. A young American soldier, shot numb by what the Germans had done, and a 17-year-old prisoner, grateful to have survived for one more day. Perhaps the lesson is best captured in the words of a German Protestant minister named Martin Niemöller, who himself was imprisoned in Dachau for seven years. In Germany, they came for the communists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. And they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. And they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant. Then they came for me, and by that time, there was no one left to speak up. Stories of survivors told in their own words and passed from generation to generation, from millennium to millennium, is our insurance that humanity will never forget and will never repeat the evil of the Holocaust.